Start recording anyway. Oh, if I unable, that's right. I disabled the waiting room. That's right. Everybody will come straight in now. I think everybody should come straight in now. Mm -hmm. Well, we're up to 50, Sheila. Oh, my goodness. Oh, dear, dear. No pressure, then. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. The idea behind this uh, talk, really, is a prelude to the fact we want to produce volume six this year, which will be uh, sort of then and now photographs of Blagden because we have quite a collection in the lodge now and it seems a shame not to be able to share them with everybody so um and it's surprising the photographs you get when you it's what's in the background quite often not just um the foreground this one that was taken by um well it was a postcard and that little child you can see next to court lodge appears in a whole series of photographs i don't know whether it was the photographs the photographer's son or something but um uh it, it he's often standing in exactly that same position it almost looks like it's it was put in afterwards you can see a little what looks like a cellar uh, at the bottom of uh, court lodge as well so you can see that down there can i do what yeah, year was the there. photo taken just there whether it was um what is now our archive room is that uh, mm -hmm window yes yeah. are we ready to go or have i got to wait a bit longer i know it's up to you we're up to 52. what year would that photo have been taken uh well the lake view restaurant which is on the right is um closed in the 1920s i think it's probably early 1900s and, and if you look in the background, you can see the Seymour Arms has, has yeah. its Mock Tudor woodwork. And that was done about 1905. So it's certainly in that period. Oh, right, yeah. And you can still, we still, you know, there were a few cars around, but not very many no. um, at that stage. And, and you can still see unmade roads. Um, I think I'll, um, shall I start? Are you, are you still admitting people or have you? Uh... Yes, no, they sh I've, I've disabled the waiting room now so people should come straight in. Oh, okay, fair enough. Right, let's, let's go on then. So, uh, I think okay. we should be in business. Starting with, um, this is what we're going to look at really, starting at the outskirts of the village at Coombe Lodge, looking at the vast amount of rebuilding that went on in the um, early 1900s and after William Henry Wills came to the village, the impact of the reservoir and railway and all the strangers and people that came, not only from during that construction, but also in, in World War I, um, the population doubled with the um, arrival of various battalions who were doing maneuvers on the hills. And then looking at the roads, as we can see in this photograph here, we're still uh, a lot of unmade roads and the impact of, of um, tarmacking roads on horse transport and so on. And then the, just the number of trees, trees that, are, um, were, that have overgrown places that were very barren and um, the orchards that are no longer with us. So um, it's old Coombe Lodge here, vastly different than the one that's around today. Um, and the peacocks on the lawn, apparently Captain Valpy who lived here um, was complete, was deaf and he didn't hear them. But unfortunately, half the village did, and they were very, very noisy. So they weren't the uh, most popular creature to have as a pet. So who lived in uh, Coombe Lodge? This is one of the houses, unfortunately, we don't know a lot about the early history. Thomas Roweth um, arrived in the early 1800s. He was here by 1818. Um, he came from India. He, he, he ran an auction house in Calcutta where he auctioned the contents of ships, anything from Madeira to muslin to cheese and ham, 
China, Wedgwood, all sorts of things. And there's newspapers of the time are full of adverts, whole columns of adverts uh, auctioning these goods. He came back to this country in about 1810 and married um, and somehow ended up in Blagdon. We don't know what brought him to Blagdon, but um, he ended up um, living in Coombe Lodge. And this sketch is probably one of the earliest we have. It's 1823 and it shows us a much smaller um, Coombe Lodge than we even the previous photograph. Um, Thomas Roweth actually married the sister of Captain Valpy. So when he passed away and his wife um, actually moved into Bath, Captain Val Valpy moved into Coombe Lodge. And he was there until he passed away in 1871. Um, and he's, after his wife died, the estate was sold by their children. And William Henry Wills bought the estate along with 300 acres. He didn't buy the whole thing at the time. What he actually bought was, uh, you know, part of the farms really. Um, so looking at the next. So here's various views of the old Coombe Lodge compared with this sketch in the middle. And you can see that we know definitely the one on the left in the top corner there is 1885. That came from the Wills archive. And the one underneath looks very similar but then the balustrades and so on have been added on the right hand side. Um, so that's, you know, obviously quite a bit later. Oops, sorry, two more. And then of course this was all pulled down. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to say very much about this, but it goes, it's, it's far later than the, <coughs> excuse me, the period we're looking at. Um, the, the work <coughs> was started by George Vernon Wills, um, they found the old house inconvenient um, and they decided they'd like a new house. Unfortunately, Vernon Wills didn't live to see the completed house. He actually died in 1931. Uh, the family did live there for about 30 years. Um, then in 1962, they moved to Langford Court and the, um, the premises were let, but it, you may remember it was the Staff College for a while, and then Climes took over, and now it's um, it's been used by <coughs> Priston, the people from Priston Mill, and, and is a very very popular wedding venue. So, but what they both have in common is that Church Warden Thomas Roweth and later William Henry Wills were responsible for the rebuilding of the nave of St Andrew's Church. Thomas Roweth um, actually was, when he came to the village, he was very frustrated by the lack of attention to the church. It was in a really deplorable state. The roof was leaking, there were saplings growing out of the tower, and he turned up at vestry meetings and tried to encourage people to do something, and nothing was done. So he actually became a church warden in 1820, and he then quite cleverly encouraged the rural dean to come out and do a survey of the church and the rural dean then wrote a devastating report listing all the jobs that had to be done and there is no way that they could ignore the bishop and the rural dean so a whole program of, of works was uh, was instigated and um and <clears throat> it was unfortunately what he actually built he had to get grants from uh, in order to justify the cost of doing this, the, way, the, the means behind it was to improve the number of seats available in the church. And the idea was they were going to improve it by adding an additional 250 seats. Uh, and partly they, they also in, constructed a gallery in the church. It, it was a gallery with iron pillars supporting it. It was quite interesting. But nobody liked the church. The, the people who actually came to visit it were, were actually quite rude about it saying it was a dreadful mess and it didn't suit the tower and so on so um, it wasn't at all popular so really about 100 years later William Henry Wills came along and um, had it rebuilt uh, designed by his cousin Frank Wills um, at a cost of £12,000 and that was consecrated in 1909 
<clears throat> so what, what was William Henry Wills doing? I mean, he actually had a, a quite a beneficial, he cared about the people. I mean, there was a lot of what he described as two room hovels. Um, and, and these were replaced, giving three rooms upstairs and, you know, nice and reasonably, you know, appointed houses. He increased the wages in here. Um, you know, as you can see on the screen, he, he felt that people just weren't earning enough to subsist on. He, did, he said there's a large number of people waking up in the morning wondering how they're going to subsist for the day. And the houses he did build, there was a serviceable strip of garden land for each. And it was quite, you can still see in much later photographs, people's front gardens full of cabbages and sprouts and all sorts of things. Um, and he, when he increased the wages of his, of his staff, it wasn't very popular with the local landlords, Colonel Llewellyn at um, Langford Court and various others were quite critical of him. But in the end, they actually followed his example and they increased theirs too. Um, this is sort of very similar to what they did in, in the, the Wills factory in Bristol. The people, employees in Bristol were paid more than average and they introduced paid holidays very early on, far long before um, other employees. In 1891, employees with, a, with at least one year's service had a, a whole week's paid holiday, which was very unusual at the time. They also had a subsidised canteen and... and uh, looked after their workers quite well. He didn't, this wasn't his only house. He had 25 Hyde Park Gardens and East Court in Ramsgate he had built in 1890. His wife had contracted uh, malaria on a trip to Venice and Florence and she had some respiratory problems and she found the air in Ramsgate very beneficial. Also Frank, uh, William Henry Wills had a, a yacht he was very fond of called Sabrina and the yacht was moored in Ramsgate. Um, it had become a very popular um, destination in those days. <clears throat> a railway branch had opened in 1846 making it much more accessible to people and the harbour and lively resort facilities were, um, were very popular for visitors. Uh, so often he'd leave, um, he'd leave Blagdon, uh, go down to Ramsgate, stay for a few days, get on his yacht, Sabrina, and go off to the south of France for the winter. Um, he had quite an interesting life, really. Blagdon Coombe, as you can see, hasn't changed very much. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me a minute. The, um, this, was, this was described by... <coughs> Excuse me. Joseph Leach came to Blagden in 1845 and said how disappointing it was to, he was, he came on horseback, his horse was called John Bunyan, he was the editor of the Bristol Mirror and he set upon himself to visit rural churches and write about them in the newspaper and he came to Blagden in 1845 and he said he should have liked to have a fellow traveller through Rickford Coombe and the Vale of Barrington, for it is barren work, riding through the most picturesque scenery and having nobody by your side to say how beautiful, which I think sums it up really. You can imagine his only companion was the drowsy creaking of John Saddle and the singing of birds. And it's very much like that picture there, isn't it really? So what did he do? William Henry Mills, <coughs> excuse me set about rebuilding, certainly it's very evident in the high street. On the left top is, um, these were the chauffeur's houses up here. Um, Clennon cottages uh, over here, high street cottages replaced two cottages that were facing the other way. Orchard cottages, there was a very large house on these grounds, um, very similar to West End House. And that was the actual entrance to it. You can see at the bottom here. This, this is opposite the Queen Adelaide. Um, William Henry Wills bought um, Orchard House in 1906, demolished it and built Orchard Cottages. And then <clears throat> he also built business premises for people. And here's the forge um, up Street End uh, with a cottage next to it for the blacksmith. 
And Frank Wills in the center was his cousin who did the designing. He was particularly favored this mock Tudor style, but also this, I don't know what the official name for it is when you, this brick faced um, stonework as well. There were two particular styles throughout the village. And this gives you an example. Each, as we said earlier, the houses were built with very decent sized gardens so people could grow their own vegetables and so on. And here is, um, Here's orchard cottages. You can see what a lot of land they had with them. You know, orchard house was actually sat in the middle of a large orchard. Yeah. Here's the Queen Adelaide a fir tree farm. Um, oh, gone on ahead. And this is probably one of the best photographs we have in the archive. This was actually purchased. I was competing. I didn't realize I was competing against him at the time, but Jeremy Locke was bidding for this as I was. And this is a photograph that came out of somebody's album, but luckily they'd written in pencil on the back where the photographs are. So the person who found the album had um, auctioned them individually. And it's just uh, amazing to see this, this cottage um, on the corner here. I have tried to read what it's, this is a, a newspaper um, caption. And I have tried to blow that up and see where it is, to try and date it, but I haven't succeeded but I think it's around 1890. And you can see there's a transition here between, I think that's a, that's a car parked there. So it was, <clears throat> it looks like a car. I don't know whether it should have been. In the background, you can see that the Seymour Arms doesn't have the mock Tudor facing on it. So it is definitely earlier than 1900, 1905 when they did the work on that. And you can see this large patch of gravel here and the unmade road. Um, this is the site of the turnpike. There was a gate going over both roads, across here and across the top of um, what is now Station Road. And the turnpike was removed in 1876. William Henry Wills opened this as a restaurant. He, the idea was to, to furnish plenty of places for people to work and enjoy themselves. Um, and this was run by one of the Harris brothers for a while, but it failed really, it didn't succeed. It closed in the 1920s and the building was later used um, as the rent office. When Coombe Lodge was being rebuilt, they needed somewhere for collecting rents, which is why it is now, of course, called the, the rent house. Um, uh, what you may not have noticed about um, rent, the rent house as it is now, is that this plaque is mysteriously on the wall. And it looks like um, there's a, it's B, G, I, and 1736. Whether that came from this cottage before it was demolished, we don't know. But it's um, something interesting, really. And whether these are symbols or crests on the side, I don't know. They look like they should be something, don't they? But it, uh, it's intriguing. It would be nice to find out more about it. It's not one of those sort of fire insurance things. <clears throat> One of the other things that um, that William Henry was believed that it, that he didn't if fight, fighting to learn a living with uh, at subsistence level with only a few acres. He felt that the only workable farms should have at least a hundred acres, and these were the farms. Um, there were seventeen in all in 1914. Um, a lot of these people had two landlords, and certainly, for example, Yew Tree Farm. Um, one of the landlords was Mr. Waterworks. So they had extra land. Um, some of these were fairly newly built. Um, Lodgate Hill Farm reached its target of 100 acres. Um, Fir tree must have had more acres, certainly in the home farm and, um, and the others were. And of course, the, the, these are all uh, reaching 100 acres. He also improved the farmhouses. Um, yew tree was was uh, doubled in size. Um, and he went out of his way to try and make people's, and Diplin was a new one as well. The other interesting thing that happened uh, in this period was the, the commons. Um, they came up for auction as part of the Rington Estate in 1895. And the person who bought them was part of the Haviat estate, Mr. James Gibson. Unfortunately, 
took a sort of very hard attitude about anybody who was using the commons to cope to get rabbits or bracken or anything else. Um, and it, it, I don't think he was very happy there in the end. He, he also bought Lower Ellick Farm and, and um, it was a huge auction, um, 6,000 acres in all. The estate hadn't been broken up over the years rather like the manor of Blagden had. It had stayed in one family and um, it came to 1895, the whole thing was broken up. There were 26 farms in total sold, as well as the common land, Blackdown and um, Burrington Ham, and the Ellick Farms and so on. Luckily, it came back on the market again in 1909, and William Henry Wills bought the commons. And immediately, really, he bought it in April, and by the end of the year, they were already trying to regulate the commons. What he did, he was concerned about is that there was an increasing number of day trippers coming out with motorized transport. People find it easier to come out here. And they were um, lighting fires, which of course was quite dangerous with dry bracken. Um, there was indiscriminate quarrying and the rabbit population wasn't under control. So, there was a public meeting in um, the Langford Inn in 1909, in December, and the whole purpose of it was you needed two thirds to be in favour, at which point um, the agriculture, <coughs> let me get this right. Mm. We had to prove that the um, regulation of the commons would be of benefit to the immediate community. And if two thirds voted at the, um, at, the, at the public meeting, then the provisional order and the board's report would then be presented to parliament, which appointed a select committee. And if the committee approved it, it then went on to um, pass the act. And basically the regulation of the commons meant it would be, it would be managed by a group of conservators whose duty was to look after the commons and in order to do that properly they then had sent a valuer out who examined the uh, interests of all the tenants and anybody else who had rights on the common. Um, there was a huge problem with rabbits it was astonishing they had um, at the time of the meeting they destroyed 3,000 rabbits in six all weeks and they'd hoped to do another 5,000 over the winter. Mm. And people who drove through here in 1950 described their headlamps lighting up thousands of rabbits on the hills. And you can see from the vegetation that the rabbits were actually keeping the growth down of, of shrubs and things. Because of course in 1953 came myxomatosis, which wiped out very large numbers of rabbits and you can see the, photo, the picture on the top here shows perhaps the 1970s and the, no rabbits controlling the growth. The, um, by 1970s, it was covered with shrubs and bracken and everything else. So, you know, I think there's been a, a plan recently, hasn't there, to remove some of the un, unwanted trees and growth. But there's an astonishing difference, isn't there, between here um, and when you get back up there, this was at this postcard was obviously Rock of Ages, which was a, was a quite a popular topic at the time. A reservoir and railway really were the things that changed things dramatically. Um, Jackie's going to talk about this in July, but um, basically from a sort of timeline point of view, Bristol Waterworks bill was passed to build the reservoir in 1988-9 and work started in 91. Um, and it went on for eight years. And you can see amongst this, so was Wills was rebuilding half the village, of course. Um, you know, you think of it, he'd started already in demolishing houses in the main street and so on. Um, the light railway was less of an impact. It started in 1898 and finished in 1901. And as it says, 1500 passengers traveled on the first day. The children had a day off school and a free trip to Burrington but they had to walk back, so they didn't get a lift back again. Um, 
and the railway was closed for passengers in uh, 1930 and uh, for goods in 1950. But it did support the sack factory, if you remember, uh, which was running for um, quite a while during the war years, particularly before it moved down to um, Pear Tree. And what brought, what happened, of course, with all this is a load of strangers coming to the village. Navvies were housed in huts near the, near, the, um, near the lake. And a lot of, actually, some of the local people went down and lived in these huts as well. Um, they didn't talk, of course, stay in Blagdon. There was, there was people living in Buckcombe and Nemnet and so on. Um, but there was, you know, there were problems with drunken navvies. It, it was a question of lock up your daughters, really, for quite a while, I think. Some of them stayed on and uh, married local girls. Um, they, uh, one of the, the biggest impact, of course, was well, the inspection house was built for the directors who came to oversee the works. And after the lake was built, it, they had um, directors meetings once a year. There was a caretaker who lived rent free in the inspection house um, and had to basically serve meals for the for the directors when they came for the meetings. And then during the First World War, people would come and stay out here for weekends. It would uh, to give them a break from the bombing in Bristol. Uh, so the damage to the roads was the most uh, obvious thing really. And you can see the description down there. Um, these were very heavy machines uh, hauling stone from Sanford station. Um, there were steam rollers came along and compacted the ground so much that it caused huge problems with horse transport. Because even if you put plugs in horses' hooves, the ground was so compacted, the plugs didn't make any impression on the surfaces. Mm -hmm. And people were having lots of problems, especially moving horses out of fields, or they have been working in the fields. Coming out onto the roads, there were, you know, there were lots of complaints about people with horses, you know, hurting their knees and so on with slipping. And this, this person who wrote this was obviously not at all happy with the fact that wealthy people seem to be managing to cope, but if you had to walk, there were ditches, <coughs> <coughs> ruts the size of ditches in the roads. But the, one of the good things that came out of it was the, um, the concept of having fishing in the lake. They hadn't originally planned to do it. Um, and they, they then got it took a bit, um, a lot of people thought that the fish would pollute the lake. They weren't at all happy about having fish in it. But having got over those difficulties, um, fishing did start at Easter. And it brought a great need for accommodation and um, tourists came to see the lake, of course. It was a very attractive thing to see. They, they wanted to see the Victorian engineering in the pumping station. And they were already visiting Burrington Coombe and Cheddar was on the, uh, on the, on the route for um, Sharabangs. This is the man who actually suggested uh, fishing. Uh, it, Bristol Waterworks hadn't thought about doing it, but he was already um, breeding trout in uh, Butley Court. He, uh, if you look at Butley Court, they, its prime course to fame is it doesn't have one, two chimneys the same. Every single chimney is different. <laughs> so it's amazing. To, he, is, he was quite a, an interesting man, actually. He, uh, was actually educated at Eton and Cambridge, and he had one of the first applied science degrees from Cambridge in 1868. He'd already started, um, he had hatcheries in Butley Court. He was also very interested in drainage on the Somerset levels. And he was the commissioner of the Somerset Drainage Act. And, and in his obituary, they said that um, his, his monument exists in the form of improved waterways, sluices, and river controls of various sorts. He owned a fleet of steam rollers, which were used all over Somerset, um, laying the county's roads. And he was very interested in ag agriculture. And in particular, from 1893 to 1904, he carried out these cider experiments. He was wanted to, to end up with a cider that was clear and drinkable, 
rather than the sedimented cider that was made on farms. And um, it led to the formation of the, of the Cider Institute in Long Ashton. So he actually, and apparently Long Ashton, I hadn't realized, was famous for the production of Ribena in its early years. And shortly before his death, he offered Glastonbury Tour and the Slopes to the National Trust. And there was a fundraising uh, effort to raise money for it. And one of his claims to fame is he invented this steam carriage, which is still in a museum. I'm not entirely sure where it was. It was in the Bristol Industrial Museum. And I think it might be in Bewley now. I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it's, it's a very odd contraption. And the poor chap at the back um, was responsible for stoking the engine there um, and stopping it blowing up, really. But on the level, it could reach 20 miles an hour, apparently. And it did take part in the London to Brighton rally. Um, but, you know, imagine having to stoke it up with coal all the time. But it was, it, it was ahead of his time. And so fishing brought wealth and, well, it brought tourists and activity to the village, really, out of the, um, all the building works and um, discomfort people had had to part with. And one of the people here was Simpkin, who had, Charlie Simpkin, who had um, this hut immediately next to the railway station down the hill. And he offered teas and accommodation. And he's mentioned in newspaper reports for fishermen looking for places to stay. This little sign here says um, trap and a, a Coponian trap for taking people up the road. He was a blacksmith originally. He'd come to the village as a blacksmith to uh, look after tools, but um, he obviously stayed on and uh, there we are. It was not cheap to go fishing. It was a rich man's pursuit. Uh, when it started, there was only two boats. Um, and as you can see, it's a pound for fishing from a boat and 10 shillings from the bank. But they were delighted at how well it went and the fish they caught in the early years were enormous. Because apparently there was a great fund of sticklebacks and other food in the lake, which um, the trout really enjoyed. This is, a, this is actually the second um, fishing hut uh, that was actually put up in 1927. And you can see there that there's some of the weight of the fish that they were catching in the early years. And the fishing hut, the, the original one, had, had dressing rooms, kitchens and uh, all sorts of things in it. And uh, it's certainly uh, Sissy Filer in her talking about the um, about what it was like working down there, said that when on a, on a good day, the whole mantelpiece in there was actually covered in bottles of gin and whiskey. So they were really enjoyed themselves. And the... Um, Elsie and Annie Pierce worked down here for years, serving teas to the fishermen. You could have cake and bread and butter for sixpence. Cake, bread and butter and two eggs cost ninepence. And um, Annie's weekly wage was nine shillings and sevenpence. Um, they had to carry everything down from Street End Lane where they lived. They picked up milk from Gallup's farm and water from the inspection house and then spent all day down there. Nanny retired in 1938, and her daughter Elsie took over until she was 58, after which um, catering stopped down there. And so it, people, accommodation, here we are, Glen Sheen on the corner of just below um, the Seymour Arms, the guest house, Gordon residence. And it Bungalow Hotel opened in 1910. You can see from these pictures here, already had an extension. There was a little porch there. Now they've got it, um, it it's expanded it into uh, for the dining room. It had eight rooms, it had a billiard room. Um, it was made of asbestos with a, a tin roof. So it must've been quite noisy when it rained. And it was originally, the first owner was Dorothy Green and she lived there with her parents who was a builder. So whether her father actually built it, I don't know, um, possibly so. And then the Uptons took it over. Um, Greens actually had their own cow and they advertised it as a home farm and they aimed to be self-sufficient. Um, as the hotel grew, there were some chalets in the gardens. I didn't realize that. We haven't got a picture that shows chalets in the gardens, but uh, by 1939, there was a Mrs. Coates ran it. Um, the London Prep School occupied it during the war years 
um, and it was closed for a while afterwards, and then it reopened in 1950, refurbished and redecorated. And it was run by the Holloways um, as the Mendip Hotel, which you'll remember, um, for 25 years. And they had, um, I, remember, I remember there was a great controversy when they, uh, they applied for planning permission for a helicopter pad, which was in fact turned down, thank goodness. <laughs> so, I think we can all remember these um, half moon shaped uh, things in here. And it was built by, uh, bought by Yo Valley in 1999 as their headquarters. And there were tea gardens in the main street. This is in West End House. Remember, as you go through the narrows, this was once a shirt factory. Um, and it was also a shop for um, Mr. Simpkins. Mr. Um, Mr. Levine, sorry. Gardens on the side. All the shops sold ice cream and tobacco and cool drinks um, for the tourists. And the Harris family were, were, were they, they actually monopolised this particular part of Blagden, really. Archie was a, the landlord of the Queen Adelaide for a number of years. The tea gardens was run by Mr. Kristen, who was actually married to a Harris. Um, the Lakeview restaurant was run by Viv Harris, and this was built by. Vincent Harris, this tiny little stores, which is uh, we'll come to later. So we, we were still essentially using horse-drawn transport at this time. This is Butcher Ball, it was a delivery uh, in, in 1905. This is the wills outside the conservatory. You can see the glass work in, in there, which is quite interesting. Um, this is the Filer Road Gang, uh, who are out mending roads. You just about see his name there, and they lived up in uh, Street End. Sorry, excuse me again. And this is not perhaps the carriers that we had today, but this is just an example of a horse-drawn carrier's vehicle. Um, obviously, a bit tricky when you get to hills; you'd have to get out uh, and walk. Um, but and it took a fair few hours to get into Bristol, but they were still well used from this area. Here we are. Carriers that were existing, Jacob Lyons, we can remember, and that still, he was the founder of Lyons Garage that we see today. The Saints live around um, uh, Park House and Park Farm, Park Villa. Richard William Stoll came to what is was Bath Road Garage, is now Grove Orchard. Um, and by 1931, the carriers were still going, in spite of the fact we had a bus service and a train service. Um, these two were because they, they offered more than just um, passenger transport. They would go into Bristol and collect goods for you and bring them back. It was the Amazon Prime of yesteryear. They would deliver the same day um, as long as you got your order to them in time. And they would take goods in for farmers. Farmers didn't necessarily want to spend a whole day in Bristol. Um, so they would, um, you could give your, um, your goods to the carrier and he would deliver them to the market for you. I know that Jacob Lyons, um, we'll come to that in a minute, in his shop, uh, they often used to collect whortleberries from up on Blackdown, and he would take them into Bristol in a tin bath uh, for the markets. This is the, one of the best accounts we have. Um, it's part of Lona's family, actually, who's listening to us tonight, it was John Marsh. Because he was interviewed by the newspapers, we know a lot more about his life as a carrier from Ubley. And in his case, it was 15 miles and it took five hours each way because obviously they went round the villages. They didn't go straight into Bristol. They'd go round the villages, uh, pick people up as well and goods. And he had to get up early in the morning to feed the horses before they left. And when they got back, he had to feed the horses. So it was in fact um, 15, you know, 15 hours in all really. But by the time it got to sort of 1919, because they'd started tarmacking the roads, it was dangerous to drive the horses. And so he changed into a motor bus. And he obviously saves a huge amount of time. It's only two hours each way. Um, and it's an astonishing number of eggs down here. You know, you can see that um, it wasn't just small quantities of goods they had, uh, which is the reason why they used to strap things on the, on the roof as well. It wasn't just a question of, you know, putting things on seats inside or under, you know, in uh, somewhere else. It was uh, 
one of the effects of um, not using horses anymore, of course, is we, the blacksmith started to fade away. This is Ernest Humphreys opposite the stores. And you can see there's a nice view at the end there. You can see the orchard um, next to the village club. The village club was there by then, but the, uh, there was no car park and no fire station, of course. Um, George Inn actually closed in 1958. So, this is the forge that was built by William Henry Wells up in Street End. Apparently, he was furious when he came back. He'd been away on holiday. And he came back and discovered how close to the road that they built the forge and the forge cottage. And uh, he almost had it demolished, but um, he was persuaded not to. You can see it does actually, well, it does slow the traffic down. There is a slight advantage to it, I suppose. And with the advent of motor transport, of course, came garages. Um, Butcher Arthur Ball went into partnership with Jack Roberts, who owned this garage next to the Seymour Arms. And they had a, a little taxi fleet as early as 1909. Garage was uh, owned by Roberts uh, until about the 1930s when Harold Bruton took it over. And it was Harold Bruton who put the pumps on the other side of the road. Uh, after Harold Bruton, we had a, a, an amateur racing driver called Philip West Manning. And he had hoped that selling cars would finance his racing career but unfortunately he spent a lot of money on advertising and lost, made a loss in his first year. This is about the 1960s. And um, he decided to sell the business. He wasn't going, to, wasn't going to make enough money for him. It was actually West Manning who had this, um, who'd persuaded Esso to have this 3000 gallon um, tank put in. And this is what they call the pedestal where they could display their best cars. Uh, it was a good good location for a for a garage. Um, they certainly had a lot of passing transport, uh, and the um, you can see here they've got what is it? There's a um, white sunbeam alpine, and a red MGA over here, right in front down the bottom here. So just there. I hope some of you can recognise those because I'm not sure what they are. Mike Tinney, who came along after West Manning, um, had a Triumph dealership. Um, and he, he'd looked at 50 odd garages <coughs> before he came to um, find this one. Excuse me a minute. The overnight bus from, Blagd from um, Bristol uh, parked in here. Um, until it got too large and then it was moved up the hill. Mike Tinney uh, eventually got rid of these pumps over here because he had Fairweather built across the road. And in 1972, he sold the garage for, to a developer. He kept Fairweather. Um, I'm not sure when he left Fairweather actually across the road. Um, there's nothing in the Blagden Doomsday book about it, so I wasn't able to find out. But this was demolished in 1973 um, and Mead Terrace took its place. This was the shed that was up the road when the bus got too big for Robert's garage. This was built to um, house the bus overnight. And in those days, the service was that the, the um, bus driver slept uh, in one of the local, he slept in Glensheen or he actually stayed with Mrs. Skillman at some point. Um, and then left on the first bus in the morning. And this little army surplus hut was on the corner here. This was the chalet uh, that started the business, the builder's yard. It was built by Charlie Cock, who was the um, landlord of the Seymour Arms. And when he gave up the business, um, Cecil Payne took it over, um, called the chalet. 
and this was demolished in 2004. Um, and as you know, the premises were let out to Taylor's Patio Centre. When the builders gave up, when Cecil Payne gave up, the Lions bought it, bought the yard, and um, the, uh, and it was let out to the Patio Centre until 2005. Back to the garages again, central garage in the high street. It's hard to believe that there was a garage on this little bit of ground here next to Oakwell. But this is it, yeah, with petrol pumps and so on. And it was run by the Harris brothers. Um, so while we're in this piece of ground, it's worth noticing you can see actually where the little dainty stores was and how small it was. It's next to these two trees, which are still here, although not pruned as much. It was later called um, West End Stores. And it was run by um, the bigger, Mr. Vigor was well remembered uh, in the Second World War, followed by Needs and Barnes after that. And while we're in this little bit of ground, it's worth remembering the co-op that was here, um, opened in 1956. You can see this was a, a, a house, an ordinary house with dormer windows. So this was occupied by the Wheeler family before um, it was then the Cooks, uh, Marion's family, uh, owned it for a while. And it was sold um, in 1955 and taken over by the Cooperative Society. You can see it. it had a little, almost a little roundabout, someone was telling me, so you could drive off the road and park outside. Um, it actually, it was actually um, had planning permission for four cars on this piece of ground. Um, but yeah, in 1971, it had there was planning permission for four cars to be built on the site, four houses, sorry, to be built on the site. But um, it was sold again, and the. Uh, the house was converted back to, um, to a normal residence. And this is just an example of the goods that people sold. If you look at the size of that tiny dainty stores or West End shopping, they didn't just sell cigarettes, tobacco and a bit of fruit and so on. There's fancy goods, stationery, toys, drapery, wools and all sorts of things. And of course, when the, when the uh, co-op opened, this was a big rivalry to the other shops in the village, you know, the, all sorts of provisions from furniture and um, kitchen cabinets and all sorts of things. Apparently, West End stores, Linda was telling me, a yeah. chap called Mr. Williams ran it. Right. Must have been before he shut, going back. And my dad used to go in there for things. And he always used to say, oh, I've just sold the last one. Oh, did he? Everything, <laughs> yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever he had in there, yeah. Oh, good. So, yeah. Like sweets and ice creams and stuff, yeah. Yeah. Now back to garages again. This is um, the beginnings of Mendip Garage. This is, must be one of the oldest businesses in the village. Um, you can see they've got open sheds here. Um, this was the beginnings of... Uh, Jacob Lyon started a carrier business in 1897 with horse-drawn carriage and he went into Bristol once a day. But then in 1913-14, he, um, he had the first, uh, his first motor bus. Um, it was actually built by Fred Watts, Olga's grandfather. And it was a, a Daimler, the coachwork of which was constructed by Fred Watts. And you can see that he was very popular, his charabangs for um, Sunday school outings. If you went to ch Sunday school regularly, you could go on the... Uh, the Sunday school, and they had a full day out in Western often with tea and um, they didn't get back till quite late. They really you know, had to enjoy themselves. And this is Sarah Lyons in the shop, in, uh, which is Lantern Cottage now. She was one of the oldest shopkeepers in, uh, in the village when she died. She died in, I think, 1936 or seven. And she'd worked until uh, not long before then. And what they actually did was Twister and um, Jacob built Mendip Garage down the, down the hill and they moved the garage business down there in 1925. <clears throat> and not long after that, um, 
Jacob retired, and sold off the haulage business to, um, he sold off the haulage business, I think, to Ted Marsh at that stage. And um, you can see now, and of course, they went back to horses again with Michael, didn't they? And now it's, um, it's possibly all going to change and vanish from the village. Local car hire was also very popular and a lot of them um, certainly post-war. Bob Pierce lived in um, another um, army surplus hut called the Bungalow, which is actually now a house called the Bungalow, just at the top bottom of Street End. And he actually made boats to go on Blagden Lake. He had um, he used to make them in the roof of the um, of the bungalow, and he had a block and tackle to lower them down. Um, he's quite well known, and the, the boats were still. I don't know whether the boats were still in use until you know a few years ago. I'm not sure if they still are now. And of course, hire of car. And Axbridge was obviously a, a popular location here. You, you can see Blagden to Axbridge on, on all of these, which was the, the district council at the time, and Harry Addicott as well. Victor Stowell, um, this is Bath Road Garage in its infancy. Um, he'd started off, <clears throat> his father had started a carrier business and um, Victor had taken over and they'd, they had motorised. He'd got the contract to do a school bus when Charterhouse children were allowed to come to Blagden School um, and they'd also put a petrol pump in. But they took, we went to, um, the problem was that Bristol tramways didn't like to see these old style ca uh, carriers operating. They, um, Obviously, it was competition, but they, it was a different kind of business because the carriers were still carrying goods into Bristol for people and they didn't follow the route that the tramways went. They went round villages which weren't served by the tramways. But the, um, and, and part of the appeal was saying that they did offer this, this bigger service and that they had been around for a long time, beginning with horse drawn vehicles. And in fact, Jacob Lyons, who was living in Bristol at the time, uh, acted as a witness on their behalf. So did the, um, <clears throat> so did representatives of the Redcliffe traders and uh, members of the Farmers Union, because they were providing a service which was not um, provided by a simple bus service. And he was taking about 150 people. He had 150 passengers a week. Um, so it wasn't a small business. In fact, they were supported. Uh, the Bristol traffic commissioners did, did allow them to have licenses and said it was you know, perfectly valid that they were allowed to carry on. Um, and the, you know, these old carrier service provided a definite need. This is looking <clears throat> further ahead. In, in, uh, This also shows a couple of other things in the village. This is the improvement to the road. This is the original road here with no pavement. And it was Iris Vita who campaigned for years to get this road made safe with a footpath to school. And you can see that, whoops, sorry. You can see the difference between here. There's a nice footpath and so on. And it didn't start until 1973, she campaigned for years and it took a long, long time. It was almost called the Golden Mile because it took so long to um, bring into uh, fruition. But they, it was more complicated. They had to buy land off people. Um, they had to buy land off um, the lies at uh, Pen Q and, um, uh, and so on. And there's a nice picture here of the old uh, Methodist chapel, a separate cottage alongside it. Um, that was replaced, that, that uh, was in a very bad state when they decided to try and, uh, they were wondering whether to, to try and improve it on its existing site, but then they managed to get the site in uh, Street End uh, for the new chapel, and um, this was sold off. You can see from here, the picture, it's now joined into one house, and still there. And the window is gone. There was a, a church window in this end of it. Of course, 
Gordon, oh, sorry. Gordon Lyons, uh, sorry, Bob Lyons bought the garage from the Stoles when they gave up in 1936. And um, he had a small holding as well. Um, they carried on with the petrol pumps and he had a small holding. He had fields in several places over the village and kept animals. And his son, Gordon, took over. Uh, and at that time, Dick Shipsy left Robert's garage and um, started the um, repair and maintenance side of the business. <clears throat> and Gordon carried on with the pumps. I think we, a lot of us can remember Gordon lines. And eventually, of course, the business was sold. I'm not entirely sure of the date of that. 1997, here we are, is the Grove Orchard development, which um, took place on this site here. So looking at, again at the, um, the orchards in the village and the transformation of trees. <clears throat> this is looking down the score. Um, there's Kilcom House, the school. And this is the live and let live that was. It's now a um, housing development. But all of this land belonged to the live and let live. It was a small holding, an orchard. They used to brew their own cider and they kept poultry and pigs and so on. This little thatch cottage we'll come back to later, probably one of the smallest, one of the last surviving houses. That was condemned in 1935. So it gives you an idea of the, um, of the date of this. This is, um, for, we, we've often looked at the development in, in the score, but this is a little slightly different. We've got a lot of members actually who live on the other side of the village. So it'd be quite more interesting to look at the, uh, the development around Garston Lane. This is um, John Lyon's house, Walnut Tree House. And this is, I think, Boyd's Orchard development. Um, this is actually in Boyd's Orchard. I have a feeling this was a compulsory purchase, but I've been, I haven't been able to track down the information because there was a great shortage of housing after the war. Um, and these airy houses were put up. Cecil Payne, the builder, was um, he had a lot of business in, uh, in rebuilding after the war. He was in the right place at the right time. And he was certainly in charge of Eastcroft and Westcroft development. And then he came down here and was responsible for Garston Cottages. Originally, it was called Boyd's Orchard but they renamed it as Garston Cottages in 1953. A lot of these houses were not supposed to be permanent. I mean, they were supposed to be short-term housing uh, and they weren't very warm. I certainly know when Byron's family moved in, they said it was really cold. They had no cavity walls and there was sort of um, there's concrete and metal, um, I think for ease of quickness of, um, of erecting them, of course. But since then, they've all been improved with cavity walls, either inside or outside, to, uh, to make them more energy efficient. This is uh, looking at it and just seeing how many gardens and trees there were in this area. To get your bearings, this is Yew Tree Farm, still active. And behind here, they used to grow um, a lot of anemones for market, as well as um, further down here, they had, uh, they were, had a lot of soft fruit, which has been in our one of our newsletters recently. Uh, this is Pound Corner, coming down um, Bell Square. Um, that's Court Farm. Look at this great big small holding here. This is King and Stone's Cottage, where Jane lives. And look at this. And this is uh, apparently I was talking to Jane earlier this week about this, and there was a the, the gardens were divided uh, parallel to Station Road. And I know that um, certainly in Byron's sister he used to talk about go, you could go down there and buy a lettuce on a Sunday morning or whatever. You know, they used to sell the produce from here, whether they provided uh, it for shops as well. But one of the other things I thought was interesting that Jane told me some while ago is that certainly post-war, none of the shop shops sold vegetables. They didn't need to because so many people grew their own. And there was vast rays of um, allotments for a lot of other people. But it's quite interesting, the open spaces here, isn't it? There's the village club, because there was no car park and no fire station. So there's the orchard behind the village club. And this is behind the, um, what, what, 
well, I suppose it isn't the rectory at this time. Look at this, the gardens behind here. Well, that is now the old parsonage. Quite amazing, isn't it? The, uh, the amount of, uh, and this is on the corner here, there's now a bungalow, isn't there? What, Francis, what was called Francis Parsons bungalow. Um, lots, lots and lots of it. This is just behind uh, this. Uh, I put this one in because it shows um, the Tithe Barn before the development. And this is um, the waterworks cottages that were built for waterworks employees. And this is the infill really of um, what's been done. Here's the car park for the village club and the club down here. Here's the road going off down. Garston cottages. And then the orchard that was attached to um, Walnut Tree House is so now, there's the development. And the waterworks cottage is over here. And the opposite happened in Street End Lane. Um, this was a fairly barren development. I think we now know that most of these houses were built in 1821 on what they call the stone gravel pits. But this is what they looked like um, originally. Of course, they're now lots and lots lots more trees. This is, um, this is Pete's house um, over here. And this is Rock Cottage. Uh, this is Ingle down here, wayside. And the beech trees, the famous beech trees in uh, the rectory drive, which made the school very dark. The school farm over here. This is the little cottage we just looked at at the top of the score, giving you an idea of size of the place, um, just as a, an example of how small they were. Uh, this, was, I found, this was known as Hill Cottage. Both cottages had one room and a scullery downstairs, and in the Hiles there was a bunk bed built into a wall with a curtain to screen, and upstairs just one room, and a family lived next, oh golly, sorry. A family lived next door in um, in the other cottage, and they were actually um, condemned in 1935 and demolished. You can still see the foundations up there, but they're not um, obviously no house. And finally, to end, um, this is really the, the the main change in the village. I would say um, population hasn't changed that much. A um, little bit, a little bit more now, but the real difference is in the number of houses. 1911, 233 and total households in 2011, 499. Um, so a lot more people were squashed into far fewer houses back in 1911. And there we are. That's the end of my talk, I hope. It's illustrated some of the changes that happened and some of the people who made it possible. Uh, unmute myself. Sheila, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Very much fascinating. If anybody would like to ask any questions, yes, well, <laughs> yeah. anybody would like to ask any questions, do unmute yourselves. I think if you hit your space bar, that will unmute you or use the unmute down on the bottom Andrew? left. Andrew, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Alan, um, Sheila, um, Bell Square. Was there a public house in there at some time? Yes, there was, the Bell Inn, yes. And you can actually see the outline of the doors and the windows there. In fact, Peter King is uh, currently doing some more research on it because he used to live in the house behind there. And um, it, it was active until the early 1800s. Right. Um, 1830s and 40s, it's still mentioned. And then it became, uh, it was used by the Baptists um, as, a, as a, up the upstairs room that you could reach via an external staircase was used for 25 years from 1850 to 1875 by the Baptists before their chapel was built. Um, I took some pictures of the walls the other weekend, just to so yes. see the windows and the doors. Yeah, it was quite a big thing. Hannah, Hannah Moore's sister, uh, recorded having uh, breakfast there before they went to church and it was they held auctions there it was actually quite a quite a you know popular inn it was probably quite a good place but um 
with no pictures of it or paintings or anything. Yeah, we haven't got any pictures of it other than the wall. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for a lovely talk. John, come on in. Yeah, can I just ask the houses, the two houses either end of Garston Lane, um, either yeah. end of the area houses, were they built at the same time? As the area houses, they don't, I mean, they're not the same, they're, they're a different build, so I just wonder. Yeah, no, I think they were built at a slightly different time, but I think I think Cecil Payne was still, Charlie, Chappie Payne was still the man. Um, he was who, still building there, was he? Who, who, who put them in, yeah, but I think they were slightly different. Yes. Okay. Another little point that might be of interest is you mentioned Johnny Upton that ran the Mendip Hotel. Yes. We um, also, up in the fields, we had, uh, when I had the, Butcher's business. The fields up the end of the lane there were called Hartfield and Bloody Field. Oh yeah. And in between the two fields, they they had the initial Johnny Upton and um, um, Arthur Ball built the original fat factory. Oh yes. Um, before it moved up to where the um, men wood shavings are now. Yes. They had a, they had a melt you know a place where they could bring in other butchers' meat, uh, fats and and rubbish and yeah melt it down and you know. Render it all. I remember them saying when the wind blew in a certain direction, you could smell it all over Blagden, couldn't you? Yeah, not that one. The, the, the fat battery up the top, yeah. Oh, up the top. Oh, I, oh, I see. So we had another one down here. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. it was behind the shop, right behind. No, the I shop. didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Not to, people do. Yeah. No, I did. We'll have to write that down. Actually, send send me an email with that, will you, please? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Any more? Oh. Don't be shy. We haven't got everybody's picture on there. So no, you can't get everybody on. That's so probably a quite a long time we've sat down for, haven't it? Yeah. That's actually a question, but just an appreciation, really, of all those photographs that you find every time. Yeah, I know, yeah. There's it's surprising how many we've got, actually, isn't yeah. it? Really, yeah. well, there's always something that I think, oh, I don't think I've seen that one before. So yeah. The um, petrol pumps opposite the garage and things like yeah. that. We call that particular photograph. So, yeah. And not very long ago, actually. It's surprising, isn't it, really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, it seems that to us, and then you have to remember. <laughs> actually, 1950 was quite a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So, um, Hi, Jane. Hello. Um, I'd just like to add something, a little thing, because all that's terribly nostalgic to me, because, of course, I remember so much of it as I was here um, from my, um, well, in 1944, I was here with the war. Yes. And one of the things that I remember in the war was Granny Wood, who we lived in Blackton House, she used to share her shopping out round the village yeah. um, and Mr. Viger's stores with the dainty stores, that was where she got her facts. Yeah. The um, post office, she didn't use much because she didn't quite like it. She wasn't quite sure how sanitary it was. <laughs> but the, but the um, coal store, which was Redwoods then, that's where she bought most of her stuff, bacon and that sort of thing. Right. Then up in Sovereign Cottage was Mrs. Cryer. And Mrs. Cryer, that was, that was where she spent her points. And of course, then there was the lovely Coles Bakery where we all used to go. And she, the great favorite from Mr. Coles, Daddy Coles, was his um, sticky buns. Oh, yes. and, and I remember that so well, having tea on the lawn at Blagden House with sticky buns and the wasps. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but Mr. Viger was, he was quite frightening. I was quite frightened of him. But I do remember that he was the first shop in the village to have ice cream after the war. Oh. And they were little sort of cylinder circles of vanilla ice cream wrapped up in a, in a little bit of paper. And we all queued to go and get ice cream from Mr. Viger. That marvellous. Yeah. At, at the end of the war. Oh, yeah. lovely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was nice. Yeah, good. I, I, yeah. Sheila, I always, um, 
uh, would uh, be very grateful to Gordon Lyons because he always left a can of petrol behind the petrol pumps overnight if you ever ran out. Did he? I used that too. As a well, poor student, student running an old Ford Anglia on fumes, I very often had to go and get that can of petrol. <laughs> I, I used to go back next day to pay him and he'd say, oh, a couple of bob, John, that's all I need, a couple of bob. Isn't that nice? Mm. Isn't that nice? Yeah. I, uh, following on from Jane's uh, conversation, I remember... Um, now, what was I going to say? What, the train? No. No? Don't know. Should we come back in? I'll we... come back in <laughs> when I do remember. Yeah. Was it to do with shops? Or... Uh, possibly. Okay. No. no. All right, we'll join you when, when we remember. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? No, I do. I do remember going on the one of the last trains to come into the village, oh, um, when which was when um, um, the sack factory used the trains, and they um, that that was when they were down by the station. Yes, and I remember going on the trains and um, one of the last ones. But my grandfather and grandmother, my grandfather, who was the rector of Buckham, he came from Walsingham, where he'd been rector, to be rector of Buckham on the train, complete with all his family. My, well, that was my mother and uh, her governess, because she didn't go to school, her governess. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the gardener and the groom and the pony and the donkey and the goats and the chickens and, and the, all the furniture and they walked from the station to Buckham Rectory. Goodness That me. was in 1921. Gosh. Yeah. All right. You can. <laughs> okay. Look, that one says. Can I just say how lucky this village is to have uh, yes. Husband, yeah. I do remember now that uh, being taken by my aunt to walk up from Langford to Blackton uh, to the bakery uh, where my mother's cousin uh, Coles would give me a bun every time ah. and would walk yeah, in to the bakery. Yeah. And also at that time there was a wool shop over in Park Street. Uh right down by the uh corner where it goes on to the lane across the cemetery. Uh, but that's as much as I remember of the village at that okay. time. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hello, Sheila. Sheila, I, I, am I on audio? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yes. OK. Um, Beryl's come up with what she actually remembers. But one remarkable thing that uh, Janet and I remember, and it might have been, might have been what she was struggling to remember, which was when you go down uh, alongside the orchard and you're getting heading in the direction of the lake, many people might wonder, what is that strange step-like arrangement that, um, that, that, that goes along? Well, she said that, um, I think it was a member of her family, used to grow thistles on there. Oh. And she can correct me now with um, with we're having a kind of a dialogue. Hello, Beryl, and um, because it was associated, I think, with the factory for the for the sacks. Am, am I remembering correctly, Beryl? Uh, 
not as far as I know. Um, it was way in the past that they were grown. Yeah, I, I, I think my father did some research. Um, so and 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 I'll dig through his files and and try and get those over to the society if they're interested regarding the growth of uh, teasels. Teasels, uh, sorry, you're you're teasels. right. You can you can see the the um, what's the word I want the, the terracing below the church. Yeah, is, is, is left. Um, but but that I I thought was much earlier, and I've I've. Uh, yes, thanks. I think. Thanks to the publications of the Historical Society, I've come to learn that was actually much, much more recent in, in history. But I think we have some information oh, yeah. about that. But Dominic, I think that's perhaps what you're referring to. Yes. Yes. Indeed. And good to see you both. <laughs> Mary, you were trying to come in. Sorry. Mary Mead. Mary Mead. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Mary. Mary, you're on mute. When can I pick up one? Mary, you're on mute. Uh, hasn't heard uh, there you are, yes. Okay. Yeah. That's right, yes, you're on now. <laughs> just going to say how lucky this village is to have Sheila. Yes. <laughs> Too, true. Too true. Too true. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. <laughs> We're, um, we're lucky to have your support, Mary, which we're very grateful. Thank you very much. And it's yeah. lovely that there's such an enthusiastic bunch of you. Yeah. <laughs> Darling good. I was just wondering, while I have lots of people here, if anybody knows of the Bray family from Flagden. The what? Which Bray? Bray. B-R-A-Y. B-R-A-Y. Gray. They used to, which, they used to live in Coombe cottages, didn't they? Which you know, place? Because there was one lot lived down the Coombe, and then there was another lot that lived up next to where I used to live at Watersby. Ah. Ben and Susan's way. I've been given a task. Um, there was an old Bible found at Blagden Primary School, um, which was gifted to the Bray children and family. Um, so I've managed to do a little family tree for them on my ancestry account, um, but I'm finding it difficult to find any descendants who we can gift it to. Um, I think the, the PTA uh, are trying to get the Bible back to the family. Well, that must be some, there's nothing to do with the Brays that live next to me because they came down from the North Country back in the um, early 80s. Did, ah yes, no, it was um, eighteen it late eighteen hundreds, I do believe. Yeah, it wasn't then. Whether it was anything to do with the place that lived down, um, oh, the first cottage on the right, place on the right, before you get to Coom Lodge. Drive. Yeah, my my uh, grand remembers somebody called I think it was Joan Bray from yeah. those cottages. Yeah. I, I'm struggling to find anybody living. Yeah, um, there was there was Bray's that used to live there, but I don't know. Who lives there now or anything else? I can't help you there. Okay. There was Thank you, anyway. uh, there was Joan Bray used to help at Brownies with um, Janet Adicott and maybe Karen um, what's her name? Janet's daughter. Karen Priest. Oh, Priest. Karen, Priest. Karen Priest might know um, or have contact with um, Yes, the lady that used to do brownies. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll contact Karen then. Yes, it might help. Because um, I remember her. She used to smoke a lot and uh, she made things out of old cigarette packets. She made, <laughs> she made, she sort of wove them to make animals. It was quite fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Interesting hobby. Yeah. I think they were those lovely... Um, Packets with sort of, um, is it John Player's cigarettes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joan, Bray lives in Emma. Joan Bray lives in Western. Yeah. In Western, ah. Mm. And, and, and um, Jeff, that lives in what was the shirt factory, he's related to, to, to Dennis, wasn't he? To Joan's father. Ah, 
Okay. The guy that lives in the shirt factory, I mean, you could, used to be able to find him in the coffee shop. But uh, his, his name's Jeff. I don't know what his surname is. I can never remember it. But um, yeah, he lives in, in that, that little little thing, um, cottage place. It's just opposite the... Um, the Queen Adelaide. Queen Adelaide, that's the one. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, good thing. Ah, oh, brilliant. Okay, that's really good information. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm. Worth mentioning to everybody, actually, at the moment, because Emma just mentioned Ancestry. If you're a member of the library, you can access um, Ancestry free of charge at the moment because libraries are closed. Mm -hmm. So anybody who would like to um, just have a quick look at something for their family history, it's worth um, signing on. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. And you can look at wills and so on as well, things that perhaps you wouldn't normally know about, you know. So there's lots of, um, lot of good stuff to look at. Mm. Thank you, Sheila. Okay. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah. Okay. Jolly good. Well, oh. thank you all for listening. Oh, thank, uh, thank you. It was another really good evening. Yeah. Well, it's jolly good. Hope, in March. <laughs> hopefully this one we haven't had a problem like we had last time with the recording i've been recording to the cloud for this one right. so um what, i think what, the problem with this one is going to be my creaky voice i'm sorry about this <laughs> <laughs> no that's fine um so what we'll do is once we've sorted out how we get this down from the cloud we will make a link available um so that anybody who uh, wants to have a look at any part of it again or anybody who's in who missed a bit or whatever can can have a look at it okay. thank you thank you for that thank you very much bye, okay. Okay. good night everyone bye. then good night thank you see you next month thank bye -bye. you okay. 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 Thank you very much bye 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 very good. Oh, nine o'clock. Well done, Sheila. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised your voice is giving out. Well, it's actually improved again now. It's just terrible, isn't it? Where it just goes and then comes back again. So, yeah. but never mind. Yeah. Nice to see you, Ben. Yes, I knew. Um, yeah. Been a bit yeah. cold for you lately, hasn't it? Been a bit nippy in the last few days. Yeah, in the mornings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Seem to be a bit warmer today. I think the wind had dropped a bit. The wind's dropped a bit, yeah. It's been yeah. cold tonight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming anyway. All right, Bye, Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, everybody. Right. I've tried to write down as many names as possible that I've seen popping up, so... I think we've got most of them. Yes. Yeah, we'll compare notes afterwards. Yes. <laughs> okay, we've got a list on the site. That's, that's a lot of non-members then, isn't it? That's quite yeah. amazing, that's actually. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, as, as, I, as we were going through, I scrolled across the, the um, towards the end there, I scrolled across the screen. So hopefully if we look at the recording, we can pull names down from, oh, yes. uh, from the recording oh, if we've missed good. any. Good. Okay. okay. Good. Good night, everyone, then. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Right. Okay. right. I shall stop recording and then see what happens next. Mm. <laughs> well, I think you put end on and then <coughs> Julia.